Last week, we asked the question, how do you know who to take counsel from? Any other ideas? How they act. Okay, like, what do you mean? Just by how they, uh... So kind of building on checks? Yeah. With checks in? Okay. Seeing what, you know, by observing them. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Anything else? It's Gracie's turn. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to say look at Proverbs. <laughs> I think it's an obvious answer. No, there's no obvious answer. Go ahead. What were you going to say? Well, I was going to say in Proverbs, um, you, you can see that it's, you know, the dad talking to the son, so the dad the dad obviously knows a lot more, so maybe, you know, your parents, um, because that's what going to be too, especially if they're godly parents. Um, and then also... Uh, to, if they're wise, you know, and you can see if they're what was the last part? Right, if they're wise, oh, okay. And you can see if they're wise if they line up with what Proverbs talks about, you know. Okay. Okay. Anything else? No, I'm just trying to give you, I'm just trying to not rush you guys. Well, it's actually a little bit of a trick question. <laughs> the uh, Proverbs always talks about listening. And very rarely does it mention about, you know, not learning things from certain people. You see what I mean? It, it talks about, you know, you know, being careful not to hang around angry people and that kind of stuff. But... Ultimately, it doesn't really say, don't learn wisdom from a stupid person. I mean, if you can learn wisdom from an ant, which is actually something he did say to do, I'm pretty sure you can even learn wisdom from a stupid person in the sense of what not to do. You know? Right. And uh, so it's kind of a trick question in that sense, but beyond the trick question of, you know, hey, you should listen to everybody, there's a little bit more of a focused answer that, that you guys were hitting on, um, and that's you know you want to you want to look at you want to look at the kind the the kind of character of a person, right. you know like you guys both mentioned it I think maybe one of you said it or both of you, I don't know somebody said it anyways um, about you know looking at proverbs and seeing you know how do they match up to this you know obviously you know there some people go to the extreme and say if you've ever done something stupid in your life you know hey I'm not going to listen to you. Uh, I mean, who hasn't done something stupid with their life? Right. <laughs> you know, but the thing is, are they continually making the stupid decision in their life? You know, so, kind of just something to think about. Like the, uh, like the, um, Satan, uh, Satan monkey. <laughs> Serpent <laughs> Serpent oh my god. Think, Anyways, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Power of 17.
Uh, did everybody get a chance to, uh, I don't remember who was there, last Sunday morning to hear the sermon? Did anybody miss You Did you miss it? Yeah. Okay. Um, try and get a copy of that. Um, I taught on um, God's will. And oh, it should be on Facebook, right? Oh, actually, it is on Facebook. If You don't have a Facebook. He doesn't have a Facebook. You can still watch it, though. Oh, yeah. On YouTube? On the, no, on the church's Facebook. You can, it's open to the public. You don't have to have a it, if, if you can't find it, go to the website and click on Facebook. Okay. It's on the top notch thing. You know, it has all the different headings. Just click on that. Um, I taught on God's will, just kind of trying to take away the mysticism of it, you know. Because sometimes people just get a little carried away with the whole God's will thing. So, anyways, uh, why I bring that up is because it really had a lot to do with what we've been talking about in Yams and Proverbs. You know, in fact, that sermon was based off of Proverbs. So, anyways, uh, Proverbs 17, starting verse 1. Better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. So many stories came to my came to my. <laughs> I'm I, see, I'm choosing the higher road and I'm keeping my mouth shut. Wisdom, there, guys, remember that. <laughs> Better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. And obviously, there's the bigger principle, you know, as in much of Proverbs. You know how it's better to go without things with joy than to have things without joy. You know, a bigger principle there. Anyways, uh, a servant who deals wisely will rule over a son who acts shamefully and will share the inheritance as one of the brothers. Oops. Uh, quality and diligence uh, in a stranger or a disrespected person uh, will always win over foolishness in a close or respected person. Um, what I mean by that is, is uh, it, you know, it talks about a servant. So this is someone who has no right to the inheritance. But because they, they were able to deal in a wise fashion... They were able to receive something that, that the son wasn't because of his um, his disrespectful attitude, his his foolish attitude. Um, so it's the idea of, of you know um, the stranger being the sim kind of like sim not symbolic but um, a stand-in for a, a disrespected person. You know, a di let, let's say for you know, I'll give you an example because I think I'm kind of saying this in a confusing way. Let's say for instance uh, there's someone new in the church that. Um, Past-wise, people really disrespect because of the things that they've done. You know, uh, maybe they came from just a rough background. Maybe you know they have some stuff that that they did, and you know, just kind of got a bad name for themselves in the past. And uh, so then people kind of treat them bad in the church. Uh, but then, you know, they come to the church. They're diligent. They're a hard worker. They 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 really um, are a benefit to the church as a whole. So I mean, even though they're a disrespected person, they're going to get um, more honor in the outcome. Does that kind of make sense? So, verse 3. The crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold and the Lord tests hearts. This is something that pastors preach on a lot. You know, about how the Lord tries us and he, he works on us, like um, how they purify metals and stuff. Uh, verse 4. An evildoer listens to wicked lips and a liar gives ear to a mischievous tongue. Now, this one I thought was interesting because he doesn't say he does these things. He says, listens to these things. Pay attention. An evildoer listens to wicked lips. And a liar gives ear to a mischievous tongue. Well, I was just listening. Well. <laughs> Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. And this brings us to the idea of, not so much the first part, but the second part. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. Have you ever heard Christians justify praying against things? Praying against people? That kind of stuff? Have you ever heard them justify that kind of stuff? Yeah. As Christians, we aren't called to pray for the destruction to rain down on people and to fight. You know, calm down with all that, you know what I mean? We're buying strongholds. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. I'm keeping my mouth shut again, do you see? <laughs> I've really grown through this study, you guys. Um, he many goes like this, like God is going to get you or stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Or like, let's say, for instance, people, perfect example, we studied cults last year. People like the Jehovah's Witness, God, that you would strike them down and, you know. Hold on there, guys. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> he who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. Here's another example. Have you ever known those Christians who are just like, well... It's just a sign of the times. God's going to come here in the next few days, and then they'll be sorry. He's going to wipe them out. Or you have a disaster like Katrina. 
Ah, they deserved it. It's the will of God. The wrath of God. The, the wrath of God. <laughs> That's what I meant to say, not the will, the wrath. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyways, um, grandchildren are the crown of the... And, well, let me, let me, because just in case there's people listening online or anything, that I want to clarify. Does God bring destruction? Yes, he does. He does bring destruction. He does bring punishment, okay? So I'm not making fun of that. I'm just more of making fun of the attitude of the person where every single time anything happens, it's, you know... I, 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 honest to God, there was a person whose child died of cancer, and the person see, didn't waste any opportunity in, in saying that it was their, because of their wickedness and because God was judging them for the things that they had done. And I've also heard stories about, oh, it's a generational... In fact, we were talking about this. It's a generational curse, and this is why this is happening. Wait, what? <sighs> And grandchildren are the crown of the aged, and the glory of children is their fathers. Now, if that's not a cautionary tale, I don't know what is. So, okay, let, let's lay this down. As a parent, you don't get to see the glory of what you've accomplished until your children's children. Grandchildren are the crown of the aged. The sign that you've you've lived with wisdom, you've, you've, you've lived long, you've done well with your life. You've, changed, you've disciplined your children in such a way where your children are able to go and have good children of their own. That is your glory. But then, we have a little bit of a flip-flop. The glory of children is their fathers. Uh-oh. <laughs> if that's not a cautionary tale. <laughs> okay, so verse 7. Fine speech is not becoming to a fool. Still less is false speech to a prince. So we've got two, they're not contrasting, they're just kind of piggybacking off each other. The first one is fine speech is not becoming to a fool. In other words, fools don't watch how they say things. They don't say things in a wise way. They don't say things tactfully. They just say it. A good example of this would be Donald Trump's Twitter account. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Uh, <laughs> some things should just be put down and, and should stay down. Yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, still less is false speech to a prince. In other words, a prince, should, a prince, a king, a royalty should be known for doing what's right. Uh, verse eight: A bride is like a magic stone in the eyes of the woman. Do you know why it was such a big deal for people? I think with not just Bill Clinton, but also with Donald Trump's thing that he said however many years ago with you know the whatever he called it. Uh, Jim talk? No, it was. Uh, Locker room talker. I forgot what he called it. Anyways, yeah. do you know one of the reasons why I think it was a big deal is because with leaders, we look for things. We look for them to do more than us because we're expecting them to lead us. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that bothered people expect, so much with Bill Clinton, too. Expect too much. No, no, no not that you're not expecting too much. much. It's a good thing. Expect more. It, it's a good thing. And in fact, the Bible talks about this. It's a good thing to expect more from your leaders. You don't want to appoint people... Especially a pastor. Let's say, for instance, you're struggling with pornography. Well, okay, that, that's you, but you don't want a pastor who's looking at porn, right? Because you, you, a leader, they're supposed to be leading people. And I think that's one of the things with Bill Clinton is, you know, the things that we do in private, that shows, the, and pastors talked about this, that shows the character of our heart. And if you have an immoral character, that does affect how you lead. And I think that that's one of the things that, that bothered people so much with Bill Clinton and with Donald Trump is because you expect people who are in leadership positions to act right. like a leader, you know. And uh, still less is false speech to a prince. It's a kind of a, I know he's talking about false speech here, but still it's it's kind of a, kind of a principle, you know. As a leader, you should expect people to expect more from you. You know what I mean? That should be something you just expect from them. Uh, verse 8, a bribe is like a magic stone in the eyes of the one who gives it. Wherever he turns, he prospers. Now, here's here's a good example of a proverb that's not condoning something. It's just simply saying that this is the way it is in the world. A bribe is like a magic stone in the eyes of the one who gives it. In other words, someone who gives bribes, doors are just open for them. It's like magic to them. Oh, I've got the upper hand in this situation. Now, obviously, we're going to find out later in Proverbs that it doesn't end well for this person. However, his point here is that people who bribe do it because it feels good. It, it accomplishes the thing that, that, that they're wanting. You know, it's, it's like magic. So, verse 9, Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats the matter separates close friends. <sighs> boy, oh boy. This applies to so much that I was honestly decided just not to write down all the different things that it applied to. Um, 
The spouses, for instance. How many times as married people do we bring up the, the faults of, of our spouse, not just to them, but to other people too? Our kids, for instance. You did the, you know, keeping tally on the, on the stupid things that they did, just so you can, you know, when they do it again, you can bring it up to them again and say, you know, hey, you know, bringing back up the past harm that's been suffered. Well, Proverbs says, whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. You know, so we need to be careful how we deal with these things. Uh, go, I mean, you could look at the, the, the church world, the work world, I mean, just so many different things. A rebuke goes deeper into man of understanding than a hundred blows into a fool. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't read my little note there. You don't know what I've gone through with this person. I gave up, I gave up blank for you. I, I did this for you, you know. Great examples. But anyways, a rebuke goes deeper into man of understanding than a hundred blows into a fool. That one's kind of self-explanatory. And uh, I want to ask a quick question before we go on to verse 11. Does the end justify the means? No? Is there anybody who would say yes? No? Do the end, does the end justify the means? The, anything in life. The, the end result, uh, because of, of a good end result, it, it's okay that you used a negative path to get there. Because sometimes this isn't so black and white as we like to make it. You know? In fact, what brought what what brought up this question is not just the things that he's talking about here. Like a bribe is like a magic stone that has the one uh, who gives it. Oh well, you could use a bribe in a good way, right? So I mean, and so you kind of get into this. Well, I guess maybe sometimes. Okay. Like, what do you mean? For instance, okay, so uh, pastors in the church, church is doing really good, and he decides to leave the church and go to a, a rural area to reach more people there. Okay. And the church he leaves is, of course, going to get hurt because any time a pastor leaves the church, some fall away. And so even though some are going to fall away, he's going to gain more in the new church he's going to. Uh, you lost me. Are you saying... Wait, what? Right. So, pastor's at Church A. Okay. And he moves to Church B to reach more people. Church A is going to lose out on people uh, leaving the church because the pastor's leaving. But Church B is going to uh, get more saved because they don't have a pastor. And now they're getting a pastor. I don't understand how that is a positive outcome, though. I mean, that, that church is in disaster now. Right. Well, not total disaster. Only a few people leave. So Hopefully. <laughs> say like, okay, so say like five people in church A leaves because the pastor left. But 20 people in church B got saved. Right, but pastoring is not a numbers game, though. You know what I mean? Like, no, but I, I mean... You can't choose to sacrifice one to save 20. That's not a call you get to make as a pastor. Like this pastor should be slapped, probably. I I, I would highly suggest maybe getting. I, I, I'm not. Am I? Am I? Am I making you feel stupid? No, no, no. Okay. Um, I, I, with, at least with the sons of God, you can tell the district that you're wanting to to move to somewhere else, and they'll you know start sending people by to, you know to, to try out. You know, and then, then also there's there's other there's other thing that as a pastor you don't just get to abandon your post for the sake of a potential reaching more people. See, what I mean, yeah. it, it, that's not something. That, in fact, if a pastor did that, I think that they might want to stop pastoring for a couple of years and start reading the Bible a little more. Um, it's like uh, Star Trek, where Spock. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, where, where Spock sacrifices himself for the good of the whole ship. Mm -hmm. right. You don't get to do stuff like that as a pastor. Like, <laughs> hey, I'm, you know, I'm losing one, but you, you know what I mean. Like, that's that's, and that's just terrible for that church. I mean, that's kind of what happened in our church. If you think about it, we, we're in a place with no pastor. We were down to like 
20 people in the congregation, you know, had no Im impact on the, on the community. And it, there, those, it just, in my opinion, that there's no good accomplished there. I, I mean, I don't know. What do you guys think? I, I, Unless God calls you to a different church for a reason. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I don't see why a pastor should do that. Maybe I, maybe I'm not understanding, or maybe I'm just, you know, off here. Grace, I, I, maybe you're right. I don't know, you know. Yeah. I'm gonna have to think about that for the next week. No, two weeks. Next week is the Two weeks, guys. Uh, Technically, it's three. Oh, three. Yeah. Why three? Because the July 4th is, isn't a discussion night, it's a um, uh, party. party. Yeah. So next week, two weeks, three oh. weeks. <laughs> yeah, it caught me off guard too. Nicole's Nicole's a smart one here. <laughs> Anybody else want to want to throw their hat into the ring on this question? Does the end justify the means? I don't know if I understand the question. Okay. Yeah. Well, in Proverbs uh, 8, it talked about a bribe is like a magic stone. You know, someone who gives a bribe, they can account, they can get all these things. So what if you were, hypothetically, to use uh, bribes in a good way? You know, uh, let's say there's, um, there's a drug dealer. Here's a good one. There's a drug dealer who, who's selling to the kids in high school, so you bribe him to get him to stop. So bribing is bad, but uh, selling drugs is bad, or you could and it's a good end. <laughs> <laughs> you could do that too, I guess. Bribe someone to kill him. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> you guys have been watching way too much TV. <laughs> um, yeah, but there's always that chance that he'll go back because he's always wanting more. Just more, you know, yeah. More and more. Basically, the idea, the qu yeah. let me reword the question. Does the result that you get make how you got there okay. Does that kind of make sense? Um, yeah, yeah. Is it okay to do something immoral for the sake of morality? No. Like, that's a good way of asking it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like, okay, a missionary is trying to get Bibles into a country. Good. But in order to do it, he has to lie to the government and he has to steal a plane or I don't know, fill in the blank. He has to do immoral things to reach that end. Does the the end end result, getting that Bible to the people who don't have them, justify the bad things that he had to do to get there? No. no. no? Well, isn't that some, like some missionaries are not allowed to go into the countries uh, as missionaries, so they have to go in as a teacher? And now we're getting into all kinds of gray zones. Let's let's back away from the gray zone to focus more on the black and white because oh, okay. we're gonna get lost in this question if we do that, guys. That's <laughs> why I said maybe sometimes. Because there's a lot of missionaries who do this okay, now. Uh, yeah. Here, here's one. Okay. Have you ever watched that movie, Machine Gun Preacher? No. Oh my God. Okay. Well, he was. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> oh man, she did. Go ahead. Uh. He he went. I don't remember if it was somewhere in Africa or, or what, but he went over there and the people were being raped and killed and stuff like that. Oh and so he killed the people that were killing them oh my to liberate them. Oh my gosh! What are you guys' uh, thoughts? Yeah, it was a good result. Yeah. But achieved by immoral Unless means. God told me specifically to kill somebody, I don't think I would do that. Uh, Just because, like, that's taking the law into your own hands. Yeah. So you just sit back while those people get raped and no, then children are raped, raped and killed? Yeah. Sold into slavery? No. And the government's not doing anything about it. You put, you put like, machine guns as he had they, machine guns. <laughs> and, and, like a radar sensor, like if they come into the yard, they get shot. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's what he did. Like, when I mean, he, he didn't just go hunting them down, like he, like taken no, style. Like, <laughs> after, after the people, he would kill them. Oh, okay. That, that she, she's she's, she's imagining uh, Liam Neeson going after the daughter. <laughs> I'll find you and I will kill you. Yeah, I mean, like of course, but. If he was hunting them down, that's a, that's a different 
<laughs> okay, let me give a more radical example. Okay, so um, uh, a person um, is decides in order to save America, they have to start a civil war, and so they lead a civil war. Civil war. They're successful, and America is saved from whatever it was that he needed to save it from aliens or zombies or whatever. Uh, <laughs> see what I mean? Be thinking about this, guys, because this isn't as easy as it sounds. Uh, for instance, gossiping, and gossiping about someone's past to protect others. Someone comes to you, for example, and says, I'm thinking about um, marrying Chuck, okay? You're, it's marrying Chuck. Okay, okay, all right. But I know that Chuck was, uh, ha was married to this other woman that he abused. Well, he wasn't really, guys. Okay, yeah. but follow the, follow along. Yeah, 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 yeah. See what I mean? So then I and then it turns into like a gossiping thing. Uh, but I'm saving this person from being potentially abused. You can't honestly say it's okay to sit back and do nothing. No. Lead them to the newspaper clip. <laughs> <laughs> Let me send you this uh, police log here. <laughs> Um, murder, I already gave this but example. But if it's public knowledge, then is it gossip? Yes. <laughs> if anyone can find was it. Was it public knowledge? If it's in the police logs. Maybe there was no police logs. If he got caught. Maybe he never got caught. <laughs> you guys, be thinking about that. Um, I already gave this example. Murder or instigating civil war for freedom. Um. And actually, the shotgun preacher was a good example of that one, too. Um, reprimanding a child harshly and severely to stop the negative action in the future. Wow. Which... How, so, how harshly? What do you mean, like... Um... Like locking them in their room? <laughs> <laughs> See that? I didn't say anything. Oh, uh, I didn't mean to. I was talking about you. I was talking about somebody else. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyways um, okay would be an example of that um, let's say hypothetically Micah walks out the front door and walks down the street hypothetically <laughs> and so you take a belt and you just like beat the snot out of him as you should <laughs> I mean, uh, an example like that. We're reprimanding the child harsh and severely, but so that way in the future, they don't do something that could potentially kill them. Maybe. You don't have to give a question yet. Just, just think about it. Disobeying your boss for the sake of efficiency. Your boss specifically told you to do this thing, but you realize how stupid and short-sighted it is, so you decided to do it this way. It's a better way to do it. But your boss didn't hire you for your ideas, he hired you to do the job. But you're saving the boss money. Is that... Oh, that's my opinion. I don't want you guys to read my opinion. I want to hear your opinions. Hold on, let me write this down. You don't have to write these things down, these are examples. <laughs> uh, um, okay, the first one. No, 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 no. no the, don't, don't pay attention to those. Those are just to get your mind going. Oh, the idea is what we're talking about. I think about. It's, as long as it, it's it's with the right for a good cause with the right motive it's okay. Now hold on. <laughs> to combat that idea to combat that idea movies are full of examples of, of this kind of stuff <laughs> happening. Yeah. You know, where they meant it for good, but it went bad. Uh, here's an example from a video game. Yes, I'm going to use a video game for example. <laughs> Sue me. Sue me. There's a game called Bioshock. And in the game, they're trying to make a good society. And so in order to do that, they remove all the bo bonds of religion, all the bonds from... Uh, science has no limits. They can do whatever they want, like taking some guy's head and putting it on some other guy's body. <laughs> uh, you know, no question as to as to the goodness of it, just freedom, okay? In order to make to make a more efficient society, and as a result, the scientists go too far and they start making people, I mean, just completely hacking at people, removing faces, putting in extra eyes, you know, basically uh, making a society of, of drugged out uh, psychos, 
basically, if you ever played the game, it's kind of scary game. Uh, but they did it with good intentions. And the perceived end, what they thought was going to happen, was a perfect society. See what I mean? Oh. It didn't work out that well, that way. But when we start giving excuses about this kind of stuff, don't, don't we eventually sometimes blur the lines? Mm -hmm. I think, Go ahead. I think it has to be really thought out well before you do anything. Yeah. Weigh the pros and the cons. And... Make sure you're not hurting the innocent. Hmm, okay. Like, like, I just went in child very harshly. Well, that child doesn't know better. And so, going to the severe niche of, like, beating him with a belt, it's not going to do any good because he doesn't know any better. You know what I mean? You have to take he extra. will after tonight. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. You have to take extra precautions and, uh, so it doesn't happen to you, you know? And mm -hmm. talk to him as much as you can to uh, make sure they try to understand. Does anybody else have any ideas? I think it would depend on the situation. Okay. I mean, if, it, if it's going as far as, you know, trying to start a war just for freedom, I think that would be going too far. Okay. Uh, because it can also be solved in different ways. But as far as, like, the last one, just kind of using that, I think it would also depend if you went through your boss to say, okay, you know, what if I did it this way? Instead of just doing it on their own. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. and instead of just taking it through them and still getting it done, but see if it's a better way to do it. Okay. So who would say... No, the it, 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 the end does not justify the means. Who would say that? Okay, who would say the end sometimes justifies the means? Would anybody say the end always justifies the means? Anybody? No? Okay. Um, the simple answer that I have, okay, that I have, is I go on the side of no, because you have to act with wisdom and righteousness in all situations. You know, you, you can't say, I can, I'm going to act immorally for the sake of a perceived good outcome. You know what I mean? Even in the case of Shuck and Preacher, I would not have done that. Because, first off, I, I, I seriously believe that the Bible tells us not to do those kinds of things. <laughs> um, but even though people were suffering, I believe that there were other means that could have been accomplished. You know what I mean? Like fleeing. <laughs> Sometimes it's okay to flee your country. <laughs> Syria, for example. <laughs> Can we, we can't joke about that yet? Okay, alright. We won't joke about that. Um, so I tend to go on, on the end that no, because it doesn't matter about the end result. It matters about how you got there. See what I mean? It doesn't matter about where you end up in your journey. It matters about the journey itself. You know what I mean? Um, however, um, I do realize that there are faults to my view, like for instance, allowing children to be raped. Great example. Um, and for that, I, I would say that um, there could potentially be some form of levels. Okay, so the end sometimes justify the, justifies the means, but it has. I have to make sure that I'm not doing anything immoral or ungodly. You know, like killing people unless it's with great thought out, this is the only way that seems possible. See what I mean? And kind of having checks along the way. Um, however, I, I would strongly um, disagree with Christians trying to start political re uh, revolutions. Those are my ideas, though. Once again, this is something that I'm not trying to give you guys an open, shut case. I want this to bother you guys. I want you guys to be thinking about this. Because this is real life. Th this is real life. People do this every single day. Every single day. is I, I'm doing this for good reasons, for a good result. And it's like, well, yeah, but you're doing something wrong. And it's like, yeah, but I'm doing it for a good result. Do you know what I mean? This isn't something that happens where, where everybody just says, I know what to do in every situation. You're going to be faced with situations in life when you don't know what to do. And for those, it's important to consider these kinds of questions. So. Ray Ad, who lied to the government to save the Israelite spies. 
There's another good example, and I actually go along that along that line. As a general, I say no. But I find, even in my own, I, I find that I, that I disagree with myself. Because like that, I, I believe it's okay to lie to the government for the sake of serving God. Mm -hmm. Even though lying is a bad thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Daniel, who decided to keep praying, exactly like he had been, regardless of King Darius's decree. Mm -hmm. Rahab, who decided to lie to the officials. See, I mean, uh, the two midwives in Exodus, who decided to lie to Pharaoh for the sake of saving the children from being drowned. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible is full of, of these kinds of people, and could they have done it some other way? Yeah, in most cases they could have. The midwives could have quit, or just killed themselves or something, or just told the Pharaoh the truth. But those are kind of short-term results because then Pharaoh would have gotten someone else in there who would have killed the babies. Mm -hmm. So their their lying helped those babies to not die. So you're faced with uh, with a real dilemma here, and I think we can all agree on this: we need to carefully consider the choices that we make before we make them. Yeah. All things considered, regardless of where you stand on this, they need to be carefully thought out. Great example. Okay. So that takes us to 11. An evil man seeks only rebellion, and a cruel messenger will be sent against him. And that is the idea here about a rebellious mindset. Remember I was talking about a couple weeks ago um, whether the um, the American Revolution, you know, the, the the founding of America as an independent nation apart from, from, from England, um, how uh, the fight there, whether or not, you know, that was justified or not. And I, and I brought up the point about Americans have a rebellious mindset. They're always wanting to rebel from something. you know, Kind of like Israel did. <laughs> they were wanting to rebel from Egypt, then they wanted to rebel from God, then they wanted to rebel from the Canaanites who were their overlords. I mean, they just wanted to rebel against everybody. And the idea here is that there's there's it kind of gets in our heads where we just start disrespecting authority everywhere. And the church at work everywhere. And we just, start, we just become a rebellious person. And so we get this mindset, an evil man seeks only rebellion. And uh, the second part here, and, and a cruel messenger will be sent against him. The what they had is a king would send a messenger um, that would, you know, deliver the king's decree. So it'd be, you know, bad news for the person getting the news. But uh, some commentaries suggested that it might be talking about God's messenger. Um, in other words, uh, famine, plagues, disease, you know, those kinds of bad things that that God could potentially send on people to try and turn their hearts. Um, in verse 12, let a man meet a she-bear robbed of her cubs rather than a fool in his folly. Um, and this is true. Foolish people usually aren't persuaded from their folly. If anyone returns evil, which is a which is a cautionary tale to us, make sure that when people tell you something, you're not a fool stuck in your folly. Be willing to listen. Verse 13, if anyone returns evil for good, evil will not depart from his house. And that's part of the problem that we have with disrespecting authority or parents or bosses and those kinds of things um, is that when someone does us good and we do them harm and, and, and as a result, you know, like for instance, our boss gave us the job, so we repay them by not doing the job that they hired us to do. Our parents, I mean, they gave birth to us if that's the least that they did, at least they did that, and then turning back and cursing them. You know what I mean? When somebody does us a good turn, and we will go back and do it, do it bad. And this is something that, that um, specifically God mentions curses that come on these kinds of people, but also specifically things come back around. Not not broadly, broadly speaking, things come back around. Um, you know, when, when we do when we do evil, it just has a way of coming back on. It's a good example. Let's say I, I loan Zach, you know, some money to pay for rent or something, uh, and so uh, he takes the money, he spends it on something else, and then doesn't pay him back. Well, in the future, I'm not going to rent him again, and then he still won't have the money for rent. Okay. See what I mean? Right. So, evil will not depart from his house. Well, now he gets kicked out, so he has to live in his car, which means he can't take showers anymore, which means he loses his job, which means he can't get another job. See what I mean? Yeah. I don't know the effect of bad things that happen because oh. of returning evil for good. Um, the beginning of strife is like letting out water, so quit before the quarrel breaks out. That one's pretty self-explanatory. The idea of, of beginning of water like a dam that starts leaking and it keeps getting stronger and stronger. Um, 14, the begin I'm sorry, 15, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. <coughs> and that's why I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. 
Why should a fool have money in his hand to buy wisdom when he has no sense? Now, some commentaries said that this was talking about someone who would go to like a, a sensei or someone like that and, and pay them for wisdom. You know, and basically the the wise person would say in response, hypothetically, the hypothetical wise person would say in response, "What's the point of you bring me this money? You don't you lack the brains for, for to learn the wisdom that I have for you." See what I mean? And that's kind of the idea here. Uh, I know that's kind of a little bit off the cuff example, but still. Uh, why should uh, why should a fool have money in his hand to buy wisdom? And uh, this is something that that kind of is brought up a lot in Proverbs. When he has no sense, have you ever tried to loan money to somebody who always needs to, needs to borrow money? Doesn't go well, does it? Why should a fool have money in his hand to buy wisdom when he has no sense? <laughs> So anyways, verse 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born of, for adversity. Now this one, um, there's actually a variant reading that, that could be, you, you won't find it in your um, in your footnotes or anything because it's more of how to do with, um, what are they called, syntax, I think is what it's called, in Hebrew. So it's something that high and mighty people argue about, so I'm not going to bring it up because I, I don't really uh, know Greek. I mean Hebrew at all. I don't know <laughs> Hebrew. So I'll just tell it to you. Born of adversity. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born of adversity. It could be for, but it could also be of. Most translations are going to go uh, for adversity. Because, traditionally speaking, the family unit has been the strongest unit. And so, naturally speaking, you want to reinforce that. Typically with translations, what you do is you follow tradition in parts that are obscure. I know that sounds like, oh, but that's not the word of God. Well, <sighs> translating isn't that easy, and it's not that precise either. So you kind of have to give them a little bit of leeway on this kind of stuff and realize that it could go either way. Um, anyways, so the idea here, uh, there's two different ideas. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born out, out of aver adversity. In other words, a friend is with you at all times, and then when, when things get hard, it, it makes them closer. There's of. Okay, but four would be different. So a friend loves at all times, but someone closer than a friend, a brother, blood relation here, um, uh, is born for the sake of adverse times. You would have someone to to build you up at. So really has two different meanings depending on which one you want to go for. Um, one who lacks sense gives a pledge and puts up security in the presence of his neighbor. Now I would also add to this my own little two cents. It's also kind of lacking of sense to, to get your finances entangled with somebody else's finances. Yeah. Don't loan money, generally speaking. There are ex exceptions, but try not to loan money because this is what happens. Someone at church, they feel awkward, they leave church. Second, when you give and expect something back in return, the friendship is always in danger of being destroyed. Oh, Teresa's here. <laughs> she was being so quiet, I forgot. Uh, lost my train of thought there. Uh, but then also, let's think about family, for instance. When your family needs you for money, you enable them to not be able to handle their own their own problems. You know, Especially now, guys, hear me on this. Because, Zach, you have a child, and one day he's going to be at this point. Yeah. And you'll, you might, you're young enough, you could, you could still get married. Uh, you probably are pretty set against it, and so are you, so I'm not going to even mess with you guys. But, uh, your child will eventually come to you, and you have an opportunity to help them to grow as a person or to give them money. Be very, very careful with giving your children money. Because they'll need more in the future, they won't learn how to manage their problem. Okay, this is very, very, very bad things. It's like, for instance, I usually encourage people if their child gets arrested and ends up in jail not to bail them out. Because your child needs to learn that there are results for living immorally. You know what I mean? And if mommy and daddy is always there to bail them out, you're taking away a, a, a very important part of God's providence, God providing for the person, and also for their maturity. It's very important that you just let them let them be adults. Actually, I, I, I'm a 
seeing that from um, a different perspective with uh, an ex-spouse. Yeah. No more, no more. Uh, anyways, uh, but what he's talking about here is more talking about um, uh, lo uh, loans and debts and those kinds of things. Uh, so, like things like uh, a cosigner on a loan, or, or um, well, loaning to someone in general. And one who lacks sense gives a pledge and puts up security in the presence of his neighbor. Basically, the idea is a pledge was something that, in fact, we see a perfect example of this in Genesis like 30 something or 40 something, where Judah hires the prostitute, but because he doesn't have anything to pay her with, he gives a pledge to her. He gives, I believe, his cloak and like a staff and I think something else. The idea of that was a guarantee that I will pay. And the idea is that I don't have the money now. And what he's saying is if you don't have the money now, don't guarantee that you will have the money later. Yeah. That's the idea of it. So, um, and when you're co-staying on a loan, that's basically what you're saying. If this person doesn't have the money, hey, I'll take up the loss. Well, what happens if you lose your job? Right. See what I mean? So, uh, verse, uh, verse 19, whoever loves transgression loves strife. He who makes his door high seeks destruction. What making your door high means is it means, it means to be a braggart, to build yourself up. You're making your door high, okay? a lofty gaze. Uh, verse 20, a man of crooked heart does not discover good, and one with a dishonest tongue falls into calamity. Uh, a joyful heart is good medicine, but crushed spirit dries up the bones. There is no sickness like a crushed spirit. You can have cancer and be on death row and have a joyful spirit, and it makes all the difference. All the difference in the world. The crushed spirit, now that's something, that's something, that's something that ruins people. The wicked accepts a bribe in secret to pervert the way of justice. The discerning sets his face toward wisdom, but the eyes of a fool are on the ends of the earth. Now what this means, this one kind of caught me off guard. You know, foolish people don't really pay attention. Their eyes are always wandering around. They're, you know, they're, their mind's a thousand miles somewhere else when you're trying to teach them something, right? And so we... <laughs> I like the imagery here, but the eyes of the floor are on the ends of the earth. They're looking everywhere else. They're, they're way off in the distance, but they're not paying attention to what you're saying. Whereas, the discerning sets his face toward wisdom. Setting your face toward wisdom, roaming to the ends of the earth. See what I mean? I just love that image because I've known so many people who you can tell when you're saying something, this is not landing. You know? And it, okay. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm wasting my breath here. <laughs> Verse 25. Um... A foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her who bore him. What happens is you keep helping this person until you are literally exasperated. Maybe your funds have been depleted. Maybe your time has been depleted. Maybe whatever. Uh, it just doesn't go well. To impose a fine on a righteous person, a righteous man is not good, nor to strike the noble for their uprightness. So there's two kind of ideas here that go hand in hand. Um, the first is persecuting an innocent person. Someone who didn't do anything is fining them. In other words, the fine would be an immoral action. However, there's also a second possibility. Um, not giving grace and mercy to people who just made a mistake. It was like a one-time thing, you know, the, the, you know what I mean? A child who never lies, but lied because they were scared of something. Scared of something. You see what I mean? Or um, someone who's a good contributing person to society, and the judge not dropping the ticket. See what I mean? Things that were genuine, honestly, mistakes. One-time things are just accidents, not, not big deals. So it kind of could go either way. It seems like it's the first one, persecuting someone who hasn't done anything wrong, but the second one is also a possibility. Um, 27, whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. We talked about this one a couple weeks ago. And on Sunday night, we're going to talk about it again. Watching the things you say. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge. Uh, verse 28, even a fool who keeps sad is considered wise when he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. Now, all growing up, I thought it meant this. Shut up and you'll look smart because you're not saying anything at all. But that's not actually what he's talking about. He's talking about the way that wise people are slow to speak. And so if you, a fool, close your mouth, you're going to appear like a wise person because wise people ponder before they speak. Does that make sense? A foolish person, these blurt stuff out. So if a foolish person wants to keep themselves silent... Well, then the person would think, hey, this guy's thinking about this. This guy's going to be smart. He's going to have a good answer. See what I mean? Um, so anyways, 
Uh, that takes us to chapter 18. Any questions so far? Oh, go ahead. I'm going to use the loom, so take over long if you want to write that. You never sleep. It's from the sticky gap. Oops, no. Did you say eighteen? Yes. <laughs> Look at her muscles. <laughs> yeah, you gonna have a strong tummy, strong neck. Yeah. Okay. So chapter eighteen. There were no questions on seventeen. Um. One. Okay. Go ahead. Um. Verse. In verse eighteen, is that kind of like talking about with like spending on credit cards when you don't have the money? Very good. Yes, that is exactly like spending on a credit card when you don't have the money. Yes. Okay, so 18. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. The idea here is not getting advice from other people. He breaks out against all sound judgment. And here's what I noticed, uh, another warning against house churches here, guys. Seriously. Seriously. Um, but, uh, well, I think it's worth elaborating on. What, what usually people with house churches have been hurt or whatever, say so withdraw from everybody and start their own thing, you know, off by themselves. They don't really grow. Here's the thing. When they first start, or when you first pull away from people, you're still going to make good decisions. And you're still going to be smart, and you're still going to be... Over time, you will start becoming more foolish. See what I mean? It's, it's, a, it's a, something that happens over the course of time. Verse 2. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. <clears throat> Verse 3. When wickedness comes, contempt comes also. And with dishonor comes disgrace. Now the idea here is that it's a cause and effect relationship. When, um, uh, verse 3, when, when, when somebody does something bad, the result is that people people look down on them contempt okay um, and and with someone who is dishonored like for instance this person stole at work so they're dishonored publicly um, disgrace is, is the next thing that comes after that you know it's, it's a cause and effect thing people look at you different people treat you differently uh, your your place in society changes verse 4 the words of a man's mouth are deep waters the fountain of wisdom is a bubbling, bubbling brook now there's there's two different um, uh, understanding of this verse the first is that um, the uh, the words of a, of a man's mouth are deep waters that is an inexhaustible source people always have something to say okay but then the second um, one which I think kind of ties the, ties it in a little bit better but both are possible is that um, it's more of a more of an emphasis on the profound thing that they said the, wor the words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a bubbling, bubbling brook. In other words, the man is a wise person. It's contra It's basically saying the same thing twice. In which case, it wouldn't be that he talks inexhaustibly, uh, because we know that wise people don't shoot off their mouths all the time, right? Um, 
so what he would be then saying is that it's it's like a deep water. There, there's something profound there. Okay. So it does seem like both parts are connected. So that's the more likely reading. Uh, verse five: uh, It is not good to be partial to the wicked or to deprive the righteous of justice. A fool's lips walk into a fight, and his mouth invites a beating. In other words, a fool can't say things in a good way. Well, I'm just telling them what they need to know. Well, I'm just telling them that they're living in sin. They need to change. Just telling it like it is. Just tell them like it is. I'm preaching the word. No, you're, you're, you're speaking in the most foolish way that you humanly possibly can, and you're turning people off toward, towards the truth of the gospel. Proverbs says that wise people make wisdom acceptable. They make it tasty. They make it something that is pleasing to someone. Like, like uh, I forget how it, how it describes it, but a modern day equivalent would be like an aged wine. It's something that, 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 that sits well. Okay, um, so verse um, seven, I guess. Uh, Fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to his soul. Sticking your feet in your mouth, yeah, that's a fool. Uh, verse eight: the words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels; they go down into the innermost parts of the body. Another example of a proverb that is not condoning the thing, simply recording it. And so it says here: uh, the words of a whisperer. A whisperer is the same as a gossip. Okay. Same as a scoffer, a, a, a um, there's another one that's real similar, um, a complainer, the, these kinds of people, okay? Um, and so, slanderer, there's the, there's the one I was looking for. Um, and so it's something that, that, it's a delicious morsel, it tastes good. Okay, it's something that, that that's why people gossip. Well, why do, I just don't understand why people gossip and slander, and, because it feels good. Because it feels good. There's this, uh, there was this teaching that went on in the church in the 90s that, that, church, that sin was completely un, un, unappealing. And what? No. People sin because it feels good. It's, it's good. You know, it, people like sinning. <laughs> so, once again, this is not condoning the thing. It is simply noting it. So that way you can learn from it, too. Well, I'll never gossip. Oh, you just wait till they start talking about someone you don't like. Is it possible sometimes people... Um of gossip just because, not that they got nothing to say, but they want to be a part of the group, oh, yeah. and they want to blend in mm -hmm. yeah. with the rest of the people, so they'll just talk trash. I'm like, oh yeah, she talks a lot. A lot. In fact, some people, that's why I brought up this other verse in uh, 17, some people, they, they try and excuse it by doing that, but instead they'll keep their mouths shut. They won't say anything. So that somehow makes them look better or whatever, but that's not what chapter 17 said, It was it? It said, the, the, the fool, the evil person, they're listening to it. So it, they're included in the same thing as the foolish person who's saying it. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely people do that. Absolutely. There's all kinds of different motives and reasoning for gossip and, and, and those kinds of things. You don't like the person, it seems harmless, you know, just venting, so they hurt you, yeah. Because I, I know that's how I used to be. Mm-hmm. I mean, I used no. to gossip, I used to talk trash. Now I look at it like it's so disgusting. But when I started my job, I didn't know anybody. So, I mean, I would listen to anything that came around just to blend in. You know, I'm like, oh yeah. You know. But then I started doing it just to blend in. Yeah. yeah. Now it's like, no. I can't believe I was that way. No. Thank God. <laughs> did you hear Diana's gossip? Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. did, you, did, you, did you tell Ben yet? <laughs> we should maybe we should all pray about it. <laughs> Let's get the <laughs> prayer chain go. This could be my unspoken prayer request. Go for it. Okay, verse uh, nine, I guess. Whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. Now, this one basically what it's saying is they have similar attitudes. They have a similar mindset. It's a destructive person. Um, there's the immediate, the uh, destroyer is someone who destroys something immediately, right? But a, a slack person, a lazy person, someone who doesn't do a good job on something, they destroy things over the course of time because they didn't do the job right in the first place. See what I mean? So there's the immediate versus long term, but there's similar attitudes and results. The results are the same, destruction. You, you send a lazy person to do the job, you end up all the worse. You pay them to do nothing. Whereas if you paid somebody to, do, to, to to destroy it, they would have ended up in the same boat. Uh, except they would have done it quicker. <laughs> right. Um, and then similar attitudes. Self-centered, self-serving, right? 
Um, honestly, I think that's why Xerox had su such a hard time staying open in Almogordo is because Almogordo's work ethic is kind of terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I know people who, who had to quit. You know, I, I quit from Xerox. I, I, I get quitting, you know. But I know a lot more people who just decided just, they're just not going to go. It's not that they couldn't do the job. They just, yeah, whatever. All right. They were just lazy. Um, so then we get to the idea that laziness is destructive. And here's just a, a word of warning. Don't give a lazy person a job hoping to give them the chance. <laughs> You'll end up all the worse for it. Uh, here's another example. When pe people appoint somebody to church leadership because they want them to grow spiritually. Maybe if I appoint them as an elder, they'll grow. Don't do that. Don't do that. Proverbs talks about not doing that in other words, and I'm just rewording it to something that's more of a grasping principle. Were you going to say something, Nicole? Oh, I thought you raised your hand. Sorry. Uh, verse uh, 10, I guess. Um, oh, I do have a little side note written down here. It is foolishness to reject truth for the sake of comfort. There are some things that I've taught on a hundred times in the church that people still reject, not because it's not true, not because they know that it's not true, but because it's uncomfortable to hear. See what I mean? I'm not saying that I'm mad at these people. I'm saying, watch in your spirit. No, the dog was playing with that. That's why I took it away. I don't know if it's clean or not. Um, watch in your spirit that you don't become someone who clings to something because it's comfortable. See what I mean? Cling to, cling to something because it's true, because it's right, because it's good. Not because it's comfortable. That make sense? Especially, you guys are going to really have a problem with this when you hit your 30s and 40s. Be watching. Okay, You're going to start clinging onto things that are comfortable, but are not necessarily true. And you'll know when it happens. You'll be blinded to it, but after a while, you'll know. Were you going to say something? Uh, just, yeah. Cause, oh, it happened to you? Uh, You're hitting that age, Zach. Uh, I know. <laughs> uh, you know, when you start doing things like getting mad when, when uh, the churches start changing their songs or their seats. Because it was comfortable for you. When when you get mad because the format of church changes, what happens if in the ch church of tomorrow, people don't sit down for the entire service? Just imagine that. Just imagine that, man. But if it reaches people, for the sake of comfort, don't give up truth for the sake of comfort. No, okay. So, moving on. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. Great song, I mean, great words that, that we've heard in songs before. Now, what does that actually mean, though? The name is actually, uh, it's more of the attributes. The, uh, Hebrew and Greek both carry this. When they're talking about the name of someone, it's the, the character of them, their attributes, their, their, um, their reputation. Um, English doesn't really carry this thought over, and so when you read in English, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, well, it makes it sound like, so if I just chant God's name, I'm, I'm going to be protected from all harm? Well, that's not what he's talking about at all. Um, the character of God, the, the the person of God is a strong tower. God is to be trusted. He's something that can protect us. Okay? Now, the second part, the righteous man runs into it and is safe. The idea of running in is complete dependence on that. Um, regardless of the problems, God protects. We still have to f face problems. We still get rained on, but God is still our protector. Um, so, The idea here is trusting in the Lord and how God is is worth trusting in. So verse 11, a rich man's wealth is his strong city. Now, what did we just read in 10 about the name of the Lord was a strong tower? Mm -hmm. Now I contrast that with the rich person. A rich man's wealth is his strong city. Now, the Bible very, very frequently doesn't condemn having riches, but it warns against riches. All throughout the word it does this. And the reason why is because Money has a way of just getting in our hearts and changing the way we think. And it amplifies... Uh, on Castle is, is a show on... on AB, it was on ABC. Um, and the main character one, uh, said this, and, and I think it was the first season, he said, money doesn't change you, it just amplifies the bad things. That's worth considering, at least. You don't have to agree with it, just consider what he's saying. Um... And like a high wall, check this out, in his imagination. 
Okay, so this deals with two different attitudes. First, it deals with the attitudes with other people and with the outside factors. The rich man's wealth is a strong city. The thing he depends on, the things that, that people trust him for, the things that... So, I mean, it kind of builds up his place in society. But then the second part kind of deals with more him personally, and like a high wall in his own imagination. It fools him into thinking that he's secure. But then one day, he will die. The Bible talks about this. One day, rich people will die, and all their riches will have been for nothing. Before destruction, a man's heart... Now, now hold on. Three verses that are interrelating? Yes, three verses that are interrelating. Beware dest I mean, before destruction, a man's heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. Sorry. Um, so, obviously, this is contrasting the haughty person with the proud... Um, haughty or the proud... Prou haughty is proud. Okay. Um, with the humble person, it's not... Um, it's not giving you a recipe for how to get honor in life it's not uh it's not the emphasis isn't on the destruction okay the emphasis is on the attitude a man's heart is haughty or humble and those two things lead to two different things the pride the proud heart leads to destruction and the humble heart leads to leads to honor okay uh 13 if one gives uh an answer before he hears it is his folly and shame have you ever answered a question before somebody was done asking it? <laughs> Try to think of that, okay? A man's spirit will endure sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear? And again about the crushed spirit. Verse 15, an intelligent heart acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. Verse 16, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before the great. Once again, this is not condoning bribing people, but it is saying a fact. Being gracious helps a positive outcome. Now, obviously, he's not talking here about bribing people. He's saying that when you approach things in a wise way, you're more likely to get a, a better outcome from it. Does that make sense? If I go to the school principal, and I go in and bust down her door and say, Listen here, this is what you need to do. You need to let us in the school to do this. Well, that's not going to go very well. If I go in there and tell her that she's a sinner, if she doesn't let us do it, that's not going to go very well. But if I go in with tact, more likely, more likely that they'll let me in. Not necessarily as we found out, but it's more likely. Um, remember, proverbs are not commands or promises. They are simply proverbs, which are things proven true over time. Um, we see this in, in uh, I think, um, Jacob did this when he was getting ready to meet his brother Esau after years of being separated. He sent him gifts. Why? To kind of smooth things over. <laughs> kind of smooth things over. Um, so verse uh, 17. The one who uh, states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. A half story always sounds good until you get the whole story. And remember that somebody's always going to tell the story according to their view, according to who their bias, their bias because they want to be right. These kinds of things. I think she died. <laughs> um, then verse... Um, and also for the judge, too. The lot puts an end to quarrels. Oh my gosh, guys. This reminds me of an episode of Malcolm in the Middle. The mom was uh, had had a police officer come in and uh, he got something and he was gonna he was getting ready to walk around she's like well you have to pay for that and he's like oh well I have a, I have an arrangement with the system manager and she's like you don't pay for stuff no you're gonna pay for this and he gets all upset and leaves then as she leaves he pulls her over and says well you you cut somebody off in this thing and she's like no I'm gonna fight this you know absolutely I didn't do this and then a, a videotape surfaces that shows that she actually did cut somebody off and so she did do the wrong thing and so He's like, how the husband's like, just admit it, admit it. And she's like, I was wrong. But the way she says it is funny because she can't ever say that she's wrong. She's like, I was wrong. <laughs> Anyways, and then another video comes out afterwards, after she's already admitted that she's wrong, where it shows that the other person, that it was just the angle that made it look like she cut the person off. She actually didn't do anything wrong. Oh, okay. And the husband takes the tape and destroys it and says, don't say anything because your, wa your mom finally admitted that she was wrong about something. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Anyways, um, it just reminded me of that. I know it's off topic. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. It's a good show. You should watch it. 
Uh, the lot puts an end to quarrels and decides between powerful contenders. Now, we talked about this last week, the idea that in, back in the day, how they would you know, decide different things with, with divine intervention was by casting lots. We don't do that today. Um, we also don't ask for signs nowadays. Okay, um, The lot was not necessarily asking for signs as it was uh, something mandated by God. Kind of like the exception to the rule. Don't test God, but here's an exception I'm giving you so that you can be sure of the direction I'm leading the nation. That kind of makes sense? So his point here, how it applies to us today, since we don't use the lot, is he's saying that God is actively involved in conflict resolution. God is actively involved in conflict resolution. Which, this verse is also tied into the next verse. A brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city, and, a, and quarreling is like the bars of a castle. Have you ever gotten in a fight with someone and realized that the fight wasn't actually about what you were fighting about? <laughs> Have you ever done that? And you found out that they're actually still upset about something that happened weeks ago? Years ago. Years ago? Lifetimes ago? And they're just taking it out on you now because they're still upset about it? A brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city. And quarreling is like the bars of a castle. There are multiple readings of this, um, and a lot of translators have problems with this verse. It's possibly a brother helped is like a stronghold. A brother, because now, now in English, it's real easy, but that's the exact opposite of the word that's in my Bible. Yes, once again, things aren't that easy when you're translating. A brother offended or a brother uh, helped. Two completely different ideas is, is a stronghold. In other words, the, the two different ideas, a brother offended. So if you wrong somebody, it, it's going to be something that, that's a, long, a lasting problem. The other reading, uh, a brother um, helped is more unyielding than a strong. So in other words, he will help you in the future as you help him. Um, and quarreling is like the bars of a castle. It's more likely that it's a brother offended because the second part. And quarreling is like the bars of a castle. It seems... Like it wouldn't be, uh, what's it called? Antithetical? Is that what it's called? Um, uh, con contrasting things? It seems like it wouldn't be a contrasting thing because of how it's worded. Um, so basically, the foolishness of crawling. Um, so the foolishness of crawling on Facebook. The foolishness of crawling with your family get togethers. <laughs> the foolishness of crawling over and over again about the same things. Not that there is no reason why we should ever argue about stuff. Arguing can be profitable. As Jude says, you know, hey, cont uh, what does he say? Um, it's like five verses long. How can I not remember this verse? Um, what is the word? Um, content. Content. Contend for the faith. Argue for it. Fight for it. To contend means to argue or to fight for something. Uh, and so in Judy says, contend for the faith. Um, and so there are obviously it, r times when arguing for something you know, can be good. However, we need to be careful because what we do is we just get argumentative. And we just become problem makers. If, if it's a situation where it would actually be beneficial, well, that's one thing. Like when Paul went to the emperor with... You know, at the end of Acts, when, when Paul went to Felix and Festus, they went to Rome, and, you know, he went to all these people to, to try his case. He was contending for the faith, so that the greater good, the gospel could be spread more is for the greater good. It wasn't so that he could win an argument, okay? So there's a difference. Uh, what verse was that? Where are we at here? 19? Okay. From the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. He is satisfied by the yield of his lips. So obviously the there's two different readings. Not literally food would be good words bring good results. When you speak wisely, there's wise results. There's good things that happen. Or if it's he's talking about literally food, which seems unlikely, uh, good speech results in better wages. In other words, if you carry yourself well, your boss will like you more. Yeah. <laughs> so from the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. It seems more likely that he's talking about not literal food because of how he worded it. From the fruit of a man's mouth. So it could be extending to, to you know actual food, but it just seems unlikely to me. Uh, you're going to have to read it for yourself and come to your own conclusions. 21. Death and life are on the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. It is the tongue. Okay, right there. 
Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it, love the tongue, will eat of its fruits. And once again, this is not condoning or condemning. It is simply stating the fact. The things that you say, you will be held accountable for. They will come back on you eventually. You know. Uh, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Now, it's not saying a wife. It is implying a good wife. I think that that's worth mentioning because the same is it's implying that you should probably pick a good husband. It also kind of mentions the same. Well, I got a wife. She uh, gossips all the time, spends all my money. She's never home. She sleeps around. She doesn't cook. She doesn't do anything around the house. That's not a good thing. It's implying that it's a good wife. Um, and obtains favor from the Lord. Uh, some now I do want to kind of mention this. Some are called to be single. We talked about this right a couple weeks, a couple months ago, right? We talked about that. You guys remember? Yeah. How some people are actually kind of almost, almost ordained, almost to be single. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. But the Bible does also talk about the good things about marriage too. Okay, the Bible doesn't say one way or another which one is better. Paul argues for one being better than the other one, but God never clarified whether one was one was better or worse than the other. Okay, it, the Bible does say that both are good, you know, but it doesn't it doesn't necessarily say which one's better because I think the reason why is because it's all about you. You know, some people just aren't marriage material. Some people just don't want to be married. So, anyways. Uh, verse 23, the poor uses in trees, but the rich answers roughly. We looked at this a couple of chapters ago. He said something very similar, the idea being that poor, they don't have wealth, so they have to beg. Rich people, they don't they don't care, so they just answer however they want. They have no use for manners because they have all the money, and money can just buy people. Remember I said that the bribes are just like a magical stone? Uh, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now, this one is a little bit tricky, too. It's either saying a bunch of uh, having a bunch of unreliable friends versus, versus having one very close friend, or it's saying among all the friends, you're going to have some bad ones. If you have a lot of friends, you're more likely to have some bad friends mingled in. It's hard to kind of know for sure what he's saying because it could read, be read either way. A man of many companions may come to ruin. But there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Either way, the main point is clear. It's a good thing to have a cl have one friend that's really close over a bunch of friends. And it's just a good thing to have a really close friend. Did you have a question, Grace? Um, well, I've heard uh, that um, this is a little different than actually. Go ahead. That um, the person who is the closest to the brother, I've always heard that that's talking about Jesus. Well... Remember, we can't read Jesus back into the Old Testament because he wasn't in the Old Testament. Okay, so what what I mean by that is, was Jesus a thing? Yes, he's always been a thing. He's always been God. Okay. However, Jesus wasn't revealed in his in his full divinity in the Old Testament. Not until the New Testament was he revealed. So we have to be careful not to read Jesus back into the Old Testament because the Old Testament points forward to Christ. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. In other words, what I'm saying, I've got a book on this if you want to read more. It's called, um, um, I think it's just called Preaching Jesus from the Old Testament. Uh, if you're interested, I can give you guys the names, the ISBN number, whatever you want. Um, and he, he actually talks about this in great lengths. And basically the idea is this. Yes, Jesus is a friend that, that sticks closer than a, than a brother. He's real close. Okay, absolutely. However, this is not talking about Jesus. It is talking about having a good friend. Because Solomon didn't know about Jesus. So it would be impossible for him to write about something he had no knowledge of. Like Solomon also doesn't talk about, uh, you know, uh, gravity. Well, he, had, he knew the idea of gravity, but the theory of gravity wasn't something that then, you know... Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Uh, he doesn't talk about evolution. Now that is the author of Genesis. He did, neither of them talk about evolution. They didn't know about evolution. They didn't have any opinion on it one way or another because they didn't know if... There was any evidence for it. So, um, but I don't want to get off on topic on that. The idea here is that no, when we're reading the Old Testament, we have to be very careful with that. You can't read something in the Old Testament and say, Jesus, that's a good way of copying out of what the text is actually trying to teach us. We have to know what the Bible meant back then before we can understand what it means to us now. And Jesus hadn't been revealed, so we know that the friend that's close to the brother isn't Jesus. Although it is true that Jesus sticks close to us. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Any other questions on that?
I'm not trying to confuse anybody. If you're interested in that book, I can look it up. In fact, I have it in my office right now. Nobody's interested? Sure. You want me to look it up? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the last uh, question, I mean, the, la the last thing I want to end on, and I, I want you guys to think about this while I can grab the book. Am I doomed to be a fool? If I'm someone who's foolish, am I doomed to do this? Is there anything I can do to change this? Is this something that I have to live with? This is the book right here. It's called Preaching Christ in the Old Testament. Um, it can be a little bit difficult to, to understand if you're not used to graduate level stuff. You can still get it if you haven't ever gone to grad school. You can. Okay. But there are a few parts of it that will be a little bit difficult to understand. It's by a guy named Sidney Gradanis. Not, I don't agree with everything that he says. Especially his conclusions towards the end of the book. But, but the first half of the book is actually very good. Do you want to look at it? The first half of the book is actually really good. Um, and, he, and he talks about that. So, um, any ideas on this? Am I doomed to be a fool? Because I've known some pretty foolish people. <laughs> um, I, if, if you're willing to change them, you know what I mean? Yeah, if you realize you uh -oh. realize you have, have, have done foolish come to a realization of you've been foolish and you want to change and well let me, let me give you an example I knew somebody who went their whole life not understanding the Bible at all Christian they just didn't understand the Bible and they never studied it because they didn't believe they ever could understand it. And then eventually they started studying it, and they made this comment to me. I'll never understand it like you. You're just so smart with the Bible. You, you know everything with the Bible. And I was like, okay, well, let's pause real quick. A, everybody starts somewhere. B, I don't know everything. I just study a lot. That, that's all. Like, anybody can get way above where I am. Like, right. it's just a matter of studying. So my view, obviously, was that I'm nothing special. I believe that anybody can study. I believe that it's, it's like ratatouille. Anybody can cook. Yeah. What do you guys think, though? Do you think some people are just doomed to never be, for lack of a better word, up here with wisdom? They'll always be kind of... Either foolish. <laughs> Before you answer, think about the most foolish person in your life. For maybe someone you despise. They're just an <laughs> idiot. A complete idiot. You hate this person. Okay? You got that person in your head? Now, are they doomed to be a fool? Um, think about it. A little bit harder when it's someone uh, more personal, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Any ideas? Because I'm, I'm running out of time. i got to finish up. I'd still stick with my original answer is if they if they see that they are doing something wrong and they're willing to change, I think I don't think they're doomed to be a fool for the rest of their life. Hmm. I think I think they can change and and do better. Except that one. <laughs> I are you talking about an actual person? No. Oh, I was gonna Just say that one. Oh, okay. I was gonna say I might know who you're talking about. I don't know. Um, I'll just blow through this because we're out of time. Anyone can learn wisdom at any time. Remember that. Everyone is either pursuing wisdom or not. No one has arrived. That's something that I was trying to explain to that person who was, first off, treating me like I was some kind of a golden god with the Bible. I was trying to explain to them, you don't understand here. A, I don't need this kind of pride in my life. You need to stop. <laughs> Goodness sakes. But then second off, it's about an ongoing pursuit. It's not like I've arrived. I just understand everything about the Bible. Right. What? Even about the parts that I thought I, I understood, I go back and read it again. I'm like, oh, I didn't know everything that I thought I knew about this. So, I mean, because we're not as smart as we think we are, guys. Anyways, um, so those are, the, those are the two things to keep in mind. And remember this, okay? Because sometimes looking through the things in Proverbs, it can get a little bit daunting. It can. 
Well, I do that, I do that. Man, I'm just a fool. This is my whole life. I, I've done these things my whole life. Nobody's doomed to be a fool. Just start making right decisions one by one. And when you make a bad decision, try to get out of it if you can. If you're not, then just try deal with it as best as you can. Try, try to stay right, like some people, oh, I shouldn't have ever taken this loan. Well, yeah, but you did. Now all you can do is really just stick with it. You know, learn how to manage your money, deal, deal wisely with your finances, and move on. Eventually you have the loan paid off. Do you know what I mean? Nobody's doomed to be a fool. You, ever, anybody can plow, can plow forward. And so there's no question of the week. Just a reminder. Trash cleanup next week at 6.30 and the barbecue on the 4th at 6. Okay, not at 6.30, at 6. Okay? Let's go. Cool. We're done. Unless there are any other questions or comments.